Come on, guy. Just kidding. Um, listen, we're going to uh, get into the Word, and, and we're going to talk about the desert place today. Um, I didn't, I, 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 the Lord uh, started giving me this Word probably, um, probably about a month ago, and, and it's one of those words you don't, you don't want to talk about. You don't want to talk about the desert place, right? I mean, just from the worship and the praise, I'm parched, and, 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 and I'm already, uh, it's uncomfortable, how much more is that desert place in our life uh, uh, when you're going through things? For what, if you don't know what that means, it simply means this. You're going through a dry time in your life. And, and you're looking for fruit of branches. You're looking for fruit in your life. You're looking for substance. You're looking for, for something that is good and nutritious for your life, and you just can't find it. Every time you turn on the TV, it's negative. Every time you talk to a friend, it's negative. Everywhere you go, nothing is, is, is doing the job. That's a desert place. And we're going to see in the, the, the uh, uh, Word of God, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament when they went through the desert in the natural. They were literally wandering in the desert. We do that spiritually. We do that emotionally. <laughs> Trust me, we do it financially, right? We do it uh, relationally. We wander. We wander in the desert. Uh, uh, but but the, the thing that I've come to know, and you can write this down if you're taking notes, is there are two ways you will find yourself in the desert place. Two, through your sin and through the plan of God. <laughs> Either way, you're going to find yourself there. You might be there now. I believe some of you are, and that's why this word is, is, is coming forward tonight, or this morning. I keep saying tonight. Um, uh, but, but the desert place. And as we talk about this desert place, we're going to mention three Hebrew words, three Hebrew, he, Hebrew, three Hebrew words, and, and I want you to write them down if you're taking notes. Um, we'll put them up there so you, so you can spell them correctly. The first one is Mara. Everyone say Mara. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll let you know as we move forward through the, through, uh, the message what these mean, but just, just take note of them. The second one is uh, Masa. It's Masa. Say Masa. Thank you. And uh, the third one is uh, Meribah. Meribah. Um, this is, these are three important words to know. And as we get into the, uh, the Bible, we'll see that. Um, but I want you to understand that while it might be God's plan for you to go through the desert place now, that was not always the case. It was not always the case for, for, for God to see his people go through a trying time. And we see that in the Bible. Uh, 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 oftentimes, if I teach or I preach, I, I reference Genesis because that's a perfect uh, place that you can see the, the, the perfect will and plan of God for man before sin. Right? We understand that God created a perfect world. Everything was perfect, and, and, and man found a way to mess it up. And, and you can open your Bibles, actually, to uh, Genesis. Uh, let's go to chapter 3 first. Genesis chapter 3. And I'm going to read it uh, from the screen, actually. I have terrible eyesight. And we'll start in verse 12. I'll, I'll let you turn there. You can leave it up. Yeah, no, you're good. And it says this. It says, then the man said, well, well let, me, let, me, let me pause here. Just keep that up. Um, uh, 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 so the... the so God creates, God creates, we know the story, most of us. God creates two trees in the middle of the Garden of Eden, right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And he tells Adam and Eve, he says, you must not eat, or he tells Adam, you must not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We understand that Adam ends up telling Eve because a serpent slithers up to, to Eve and deceives her. And he says, listen, you can eat of that tree. You're not going to die. You'll just be like God. He used a half-truth to, to, to deceive uh, Eve into eating of the tree. And then God comes down and uh, uh, he says, Adam, where are you? We know the story. He says, I'm over here. I'm hiding. Uh, I was naked. God says, who told you that you were naked? Right? All of a sudden, Genesis 2.25 was the, the first memory verse I ever learned. And it was, uh, they were both naked and not ashamed. <laughs> I'll just be honest. I was a teenager. And uh, uh, uh uh, so they were. They were naked. That's how God made them. They were not ashamed. They ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They became ashamed. And, and this is where we are. God comes down and finds them. He says, then the man said, the woman whom you gave me to be, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? 
The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. Everyone say, you are cursed. More than all of the cattle, more than all of the, uh, every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat the dust of all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between you, uh, your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and, and, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Every mom say amen. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Every man say, I'm just kidding. Don't say amen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Listen, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm far away from that one. Then uh, to Adam he said, because of you had heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. Now let's stop right there. So we see that God curses the snake. We see that God curses Eve. In fact, some of your versions will say that God cursed Eve. And then he looks at Adam and he says, because of you, cursed is the ground. Do you see that? It went serpent, Eve, ground. And I started wondering, why is that important? What is that? Why is that significant? Why wasn't Adam cursed? Well, let's read. It says, because of the, uh, the ground for your sake and toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your body, or in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for the dust you are, and dust you shall return. Now stop right there. You see, all of a sudden, there was a change in nature. Before, the Bible says that God, he created, a, 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 he created the world, and then there was Eden, and in the corner of Eden, he placed this garden. And everything that Adam and Eve ever needed was right there. There was no toiling. There was no sweat of the brow. There was no thorns and thistles. But the ground was cursed. And, and, and at first, I didn't think, well, okay, the ground was cursed. But then I started thinking, man, that's messed up for the ground, right? This fruitful thing. The Bible describes it as this, that, that, that it, it hadn't rained, but the water would just mist up from the earth, and it would, it would, it would neutralize, it, uh, uh, new, fertilize itself. Thank you. There's more smart people than me. Fertilize itself. But all of a sudden, things changed. Uh, let's, go, let's go back a little bit, and we'll see why this is important. Let's go to Genesis 2, and we'll, we'll, we'll read from verse 4 to 9. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the, the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. I wasn't lying. And there was no man to till the ground. There was no man to till the ground. There was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. You didn't believe me. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and a man became a living being. Let's pause. So God creates this, this earth. He creates this Eden. He creates this garden. And yet the Bible says there was no man to till the ground. And then scriptures later we see, so God created man. Now you've heard all your life that you were created to worship God and be with, and that's all true. But Adam was created with a purpose and a job. God had a specific thing for Adam to do, and it was to till the ground. You have to understand that this ground is important. What verse was that? This last one. Okay, let's keep going to the next two. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man in whom he had formed. And out of the ground... The Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight of good or for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know what? The Bible also talks about uh, uh, that, that, that out of the ground, God created animals. And he would bring them to Adam. But Adam didn't find any suitable uh, partner, right? Which is why we get Eve. Because God would bring all these animals that he brought from the ground to Adam. 
And he would, he would, no, it's not good for man to be alone. But there's no suitable partner. So he puts Adam into a deep sleep, and he takes a rib from Adam, and, and that's why Adam calls, him, uh, calls her uh, uh, woman, not Eve, calls her woman. That's not disrespectful because out of, woe man, out of man comes Eve, or comes woman. Things change. In fact, let's go back, um, let's go back to Genesis 3. I didn't give you this, I don't think, so I'm going to open up my Bible. I love the Word of God. Right after verse uh, verse 20, Or right after verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of uh, was thou taken, for dust thou art, and until th- you're going to return to the ground because that's where you came from. Verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Eve was not Eve, and she was woman. Because she came out of man. God curses her, says, now your child, you're going to listen, your, your, your childbirth is going to be painful, right? And, and he paints this picture, and then immediately the scripture is in there, kind of weird. But he says, because you're the mother of all living, your name's going to be Eve. He's basically saying, you're going to be in a lot of pain, right? This is significant. God didn't mistakenly place scriptures between one another, Right? So, so we understand that when God curses the ground, this is important stuff. It was out of the ground that the trees came. It was out of the ground that the animals came. It was out of the ground that, that Adam came. The ground was a creative source for the Lord. But now all of a sudden we're talking about thorns and thistles. We're talking about the sweat of the brow. We're talking about painful uh, 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 child labor. We're talking about desert places. No more. The Garden of Eden experience is done. In fact, they were kicked out, and an angel was going back and forth with a flaming sword, keeping them out. And now they found themselves for the very first time. Have you guys seen, have you guys seen the Middle East? Have you guys seen the landscape? It's no bueno. I know that's not Middle Eastern. I don't know, I don't know that language, but, but Mexico is also deserty. It's pretty close. All of a sudden, there's desert places. Fast forward all this time, and all of a sudden, we're in desert places. There are mountaintop experiences in desert places, absolutely. In fact, the mountain of Zion, the mountain of God, where was it? It was in a desert. Moses, who received his call and his commission from the Lord, where was he? He was on the backside of the desert, tending his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. The desert is not a bad place. The desert, a lot of good things happen in the desert. In fact, later on we'll read uh, uh, Isaiah uh, 35. Fantastic chapter. And I'm going to prophesy that over your lives this morning. But before we get there, we have to talk about this desert. Because you're going to get there through your sin, or you're going to get there through the plan of God. But you and I, we're going to get there. I've been there. I'm there. Tumbleweeds, man. In the spirit tumbleweeds. Sometimes I cry out to the Lord and I don't hear back. Am I alone? Sometimes I ask God questions and I don't get the answers. Sometimes I read the word and the revelation doesn't come. Sometimes I pray and I fast and I pray for the sick and nothing happens. I've had to have some sit downs with pastor and and pour out my heart and say, listen, I believe the word. I believe God. I've seen it happen in my life before not building a name for myself, but I've healed the sick. God's healed the sick through these hands, through my faith. It's happened. My faith hasn't squandered. My faith hasn't lessened. My faith didn't go anywhere. If anything, it's greater than it was before. Where's the healing? I'm not talking about every now and then when you pray for somebody and then they take medicine and then a month later they feel better because God created the body to repair itself. It's a fantastic thing. And then we say, God healed them. That's great. I'll praise with you. He's worthy anyway. But how come in that moment when you spoke to that body, it wasn't healed? Because in desert places, it doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't. Uh, Let's go to uh, 
Uh, I'm going to switch it up, Kent. I'm going I'm to switch. I'm going to go to Exodus 17 first. Let's go to Exodus 17. We're going to read uh, 1 through 7. Is where we're going to start. Are you guys with me? Then all the congregation of the children of Israel, it's a foreshadowing of you and I, set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, not the kind of sin you're thinking, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Go there, we'll pause. So they're hiking in the desert, and there's no water for them to drink. We are so blessed in the United States that some of you don't even want to drink tap water because you have bottled water stacked up in your... Listen, Andrew, come on. We've drank out of the dirtiest, nastiest rivers in Ethiopia, hoping that this filter that we bought on Amazon works. <laughs> We're so blessed. But here the Israelites are, they're, 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 they're hiking. I mean, they are wandering. They are living. They are dwelling. They are not leaving the desert. And the, the, the scorching sun is piercing their skin. And they are hiking with the same people. How many has been on a road trip with the same people for more than a day? You want to jump out the car sometimes. I, listen, you want to, you, or the better option, push them out of the car. But, I mean, we're talking for months at this point, wandering, parched, thirsty, no water. No water. No water. <laughs> Can we put that back up? <laughs> I love you, Kent. You're the best. Therefore, the people contended with Moses hey, and said, everyone say, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? Pause right there. Why do you contend with me? This contending with Moses, understand this, Moses is their leader sent by God. And understand this, that they have already, uh, uh, through, through Moses' obedience, plagued all of Egypt, split the Red Sea, crushed all of Pharaoh's army. They've already uh, uh, seen uh, so many miracles, so many signs up to this point, and now they're coming and contending with this man of God. They're bringing their complaints and their irritations and they're, they're complaining against the man of God because the man of God's supposed to be the one with the answers. Listen, in your desert place, contending with the man of God, stop it. Knock it off. And the people thirsted for, there for water and the people complained against Moses. Complained. Do we have any complainers? Who's going to go home and complain about this message? Do we have any complainers? If I were to check your Facebook statuses, do we have any complainers? If I was going to check your post on Instagram and your comments on posts and political statements and, and issues, and, and are we, do we have any complainers? We have to wear a mask every single day of our lives. Every, do we have any complainers? We don't always see eye to eye with our local government. Do we have any complainers? I'm going to, there is no room for complaining in the kingdom of God. That goes against God's standards. Listen, God loves you. He is for you. Uh, uh, all things work together for the good of love. All of the great scriptures are still accurate. But so is his standard. If you are a disciple of Jesus, then heed the words of God and stop complaining. Your life and your desert experience will turn out much better. In fact, let's keep going. Uh, 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 listen to this. Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Do you realize that they are questioning the very plan of Jehovah? They are questioning the very direction of God for their lives. It is uncomfortable? Yes. It is hot, yes. They are thirsty, yes. It is the plan of God for their lives in this moment, yes. 
And because of their irritation and their discomfort, they raise a complaint against the plan of God. The very thing that you and I like to say that we are going after, that we we built our life upon. This is serious business. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. This is serious. He's creating a jury is what he's doing. This is becoming a court proceeding because they're bringing an accusation against God Almighty. Do you understand this? This is what's happening. And, 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 and they, are, they are bringing the elders of Israel. And he says, also take in your hand with you the rod which you struck the river and go. This is no ordinary stick. When they, when, when they see Moses walking with this rod, all these complainers all of a sudden, they're like, oh, yo, shh, it's the stick. Behold, I will stand before you. Now listen, I, this is God speaking. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. This is, a, this is, this is, this, this is what we like to call grace. This is what we like to call Christ. How do you mean? 1 Corinthians 10. This is what Paul says. Paul calls Jesus the rock. He says the rock was Jesus. He's saying that, that as we go and we complain and, and, and as we're on the, the, the brink of mutiny with God, that he goes and he, he offers Jesus. He stands before you. He offers Jesus. But do you know that, that while Jesus was there, Jesus was, was the, the water that came forward through the rock and Jesus was enough to meet their need, that, that they wandered still, that their need was met, but their circumstances didn't change, that, that Jesus was enough for their life in that moment, the rock was enough for their life in that moment, but they get thirsty later as well, but the, because they're still in the desert. It didn't change. How many times do we come to church and we get blessed and we're like, Oh, that was such a great service. And I'm going to tell everybody about the service. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to live my life in the same circumstances. Nothing changed. You come to church next week the same you came the week before. And we get blessed and we have a good service. And I'm thankful. I'm not making fun of it. I, I'm, I'm, I, I love church. But do you realize that you and I were not created to come into this building and worship together and live our lives? We were created to change circumstances. We are created to change uh, 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 people's atmospheres. We are created to come here to get our tools so we can go out and work. But we've made Christianity about us. Well, you don't know what I'm going through, Aaron. I don't. You don't know what I'm going through. But what I know is that Jesus is still enough and that the plan in your life and the plan of my life didn't change because we're going through stuff. In fact, while we're looking for an answer all of the time, we're called to be the answer. In all of, I mean, think about 2020. Think about everything that we're saying is 2020, right? All of this nonsense and all of whatever you guys call it. I call it the plan of God. All of this stuff. Think about three years down the road. And when we look back on this year and we're going to think, what an opportunity that was. What a problem that I had the solution to. Do you realize that today is September? That means we had January, February, March, April, May, June, July, and August to be effective. To be an answer instead of a complainer. To be a light instead of more darkness. Instead of grumbling, to to, to lift somebody up. To shed the light of Christ in a dark world. It's September. Listen, let's go over to, uh, 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 you know, let's go back. Yeah, let's go to Exodus 15 now. This is going to prove my point. Verse 22. This is directly after the Red Sea. 
In fact, they, they cross the Red Sea. Uh, the Lord delivers them, says that you're never going to have to face that enemy again. Uh, and they break out in, in dance and in praise. The best thing that they could have done in that moment. And immediately, verse 22, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Sounds familiar. Now when they came to Marah, everyone say Mara. They could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Let's stop right there. Those of you who were in the discipleship class last week got a glimpse of this. The waters, I mean, think about this. You're hiking. You're thirsty. You're in the desert. I'm getting thirsty just walking back on this platform. Right? But we're talk- and this is AC. We're talking about desert places. And they finally find water. They find Mara. And it's bitter. They can't even drink it, the Bible says. I can't help but to feel that you and I might be Mara in a world who is thirsty. They come to church. They, they meet the believer. They, they go to lunch with the believer. They talk to you in your workplace. You guys start to connect. But they can't even drink what you have to offer because you're bitter. Not you, you. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to you. Because you're bitter. Because you're a complainer. Because you're a, mum, a, a murmurer. Because you go to church and you, 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 you sing the songs and you give in your tithes and your offering, but then you go home and you post on your Facebook and you call your friends and you go to lunch and you talk to your sisters and you talk to your brothers and you bitter and you complain and you're not full of the love of Christ. And so when somebody who's thirsty and looking for an answer in a hopeless situation, you can't give it to them. Because what they're looking for is someone who is calm and anchored and and secure and safe. Someone who is in the arc of safety and is not worried about the the shifty situations because their, their hope is secure in the cross. People are thirsty. People are hungry. People are going through the same desert. Do you realize that Moses walked through the same desert as the Israelites? But he was the one that got the glory. He was the one that went up to the mountain and the Lord passed by him. He went through the same desert. He was in the same heat, the same temperature, the same. He he didn't have any hidden water in in his giant robe or beard, right? He didn't have the aquafina or whatever. He, He didn't have it. He was just as in the same situation and circumstances. Yet he was a spokesman for God. I love what Dave said about Paul. Paul is my favorite. Say it all the time. Why? Because he says this. If you hold on to this and you get this in your heart and you apply this to your lives, you will be golden. He says, I've learned the secret to be content in all things. Why? Because Jesus is the same in all things. Uh, uh, David says this, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He's going through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't get worse than that. Thy ride and thy staff come from him. He's good. He is good. Paul and Silas chained up, man. Well, I don't know. Let's let's write to churches and tell them how they can improve. We don't have anything else to do. Let's send some letters to churches and encourage them in their situations. And they're sitting in their own feces. We're not talking about, we're not talking about like San Quentin, right? We're talking about dungeons with no plumbing where all of the rain and the water would seep down and they're just chained to a wall with their feet. And they're like, hey, Silas, what are you doing? I don't know, Paul. Hey, you remember this song? Holy, holy, holy. And all of a sudden, that thing starts to shake. Why? Because they were not a product of their environment. They were a product of the kingdom of God. You and I are not a product of this 2020 We're a product of the kingdom of God. And when people come to you, I don't want them to see a Mara. And I didn't even get into those other, those other two words mean these. The first one means uh, complaining, murmuring. The, 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 he named, he named the other place where he strike the rock. It was complaining. And it was, is God even with us? That's what the second word meant. Is God even here? How many times do we, do we feel that? Do we think, is God even here? You believe in God because you're asking, is he even here? You don't ask that about someone who you don't believe in. He's been there before. 
But is he here now? Is he here in the midst of 2020? Is he here when I have to get out of the car and, and, and go to the store and then go back to the car because I forgot my mask and now the line is socially distant six feet, but it's around the building and all I need is toilet paper? Oh, there is no toilet paper when I get in there? God, are you even here? It's funny, but y'all complain about it. I've seen your status. I've heard the conversations. I remember we were talking about this, this worship conference that we're doing and uh, plugging it. I'm just kidding. I'm not, but come. Uh, uh, we were talking about uh, like t-shirts, getting t-shirts made and what should we put like the reckoning 2020. I was like, no, I don't want anything that says 2020 on it. I don't want it. Do you realize that we kind of laughed and chuckled? Do you realize that I was so convicted after that? That I had to think about that? Then I had asked for forgiveness after I tried to justify. I was like, God, I mean, come on, who wants? I mean, the, the, Moses wouldn't be wearing a shirt that was like 40 years solid, you know? <laughs> like, like, but God, he, he understands. I, I, we don't have that relationship. I don't get to sway the judgment of God, right? I was convicted because as a, as a man of God, as an anointed, called man of God who is restored by grace, who walks in the kingdom, complaining is not allowed. I have a three-year-old son, and he understands that there are certain things that are not allowed in our house. There are certain attitudes that dad doesn't put up with. Mom's a little softer. Dad, not so much. Well, Benjamin, excuse me. You need to say I'm sorry. That was mean. Why? And, and none of you guys would say, man, you're a good dad for that. Good for you. Raise your child right. But then when God says, excuse me, Aaron, that was the same attitude three years ago. That rose up again. Why are you the same? We're like, well, let's talk about, let's talk about like, about, about how God's grace is sufficient <laughs> to get you through the desert, right? This is inescapable. And the standard for God's life on, uh, on you, God, the standard that God has for your life, is inescapable. He is not going to change it because you don't want to change. But instead, you will wander. And you will wander. And you will come to church and you will get a, 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 little, a, a little emotional and you'll get a little bit of, of the Holy Spirit or, or something. He'll, he'll work on something in your life. But then you go back into the world and nothing's changed. You're still Mara. You, you, things look good, but then you go home and you and your wife or you and your husband bicker at each other. Still. I see. <laughs> Stop looking at each other. Stop it. <laughs> Get me in trouble. We still are dealing with the same issues. And then we blame it. Well, it's just been, I can't wait for, I can't wait for 2021. Why? Because people are going to wake up with amnesia? You guys are laughing, but I'm being serious. Because people are just going to all of a sudden stop being hurt and stop being offended. People are going to wake up on the first of the year, and all of a sudden everything that they were standing for, is they're no longer going to do it, and everything that you're standing for, you're, no, you're just going to be done with it. It's not going to happen. Because if this is from God, the only thing that's going to, that, that's going to change this circumstance is if we submit. This is a strong word. We submit and we say, you know what? I'm going to be sweet and not bitter. Lord, throw that tree into me like you did into the, 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 the waters of Mara. Throw that tree into me. Send me that Holy Spirit. Do you realize that before Adam was able to till the ground in the, in, in the Garden of Eden, he was able to pr produce fruit? Now you and I cannot produce fruit, but it is the fruit of the Spirit. He has to produce it in us. Do you understand that? If we are grieving the spirit and we are complaining and we are murmuring and we are coming against men and women of God and we are going on with our mouths and our mouths and our mouths, you want to know why we're still on our mouths? You think pastor doesn't want to preach on something else? You think he just loves it? <laughs> this, this book is full of so many wonderful things that we can get to. But we got to control this first because this reflects our heart. Our heart reflects where we are with God. There's no escaping it. There's no sugarcoating it. It's the reality. We're looking into a mirror and we're saying, okay, Aaron, you have an attitude issue. You've had this attitude issue. God has dealt with this attitude issue and you're still holding on. That's not submission. That's disobedience. Disobedience is sin. Sin leads to death. 
or I could do this. I'm good at this. Aaron, you've had this attitude. Yeah, but I'm going through a lot of stuff, and God loves me. And I'm going to stand up on your word that, that by your stripes we are healed and all of this stuff, and I'm going to teach, and I'm going to preach, and I'm going to pretend like that issue isn't in my life. And then I still wake up in the desert place. Perversions, gossip, slander, name it. The, the alcohol that God's asked you to give up, and you're like, well, I don't drink as like I used to. I'm not going out anymore. I'm only smoking cigarettes now, and I'm not telling you what's sin and what's not. I'm, I'm saying God convicts us. And I know people who have been convicted of smoking cigarettes. Well, I gave up the other stuff, but it's just weed. I'm just getting high on the weekends. I have a medical condition. We justify everything. And then we wake up in the desert. And we think, man, God, I thought you had a promise of a land flowing with milk and honey. I thought we left Egypt because you were bringing us into a place where we can be free. We can come into our own. We can establish a nation. We don't have to be in bondage anymore. And we are in bondage to ourselves. We're in bondage to our flesh. We're in bondage to our thoughts. And guess what? The answer is all in the Bible. What do we do with thoughts? We cast them down. And every high thing that exalts itself over the, we have the answer. I don't want, there, there, there's been prophecy over this house saying that it's going to be a center of influence. I believe it 130%. I, I just did what I hate. 100%. There is no 130. 100%. I believe it. A center of influence. But do you realize that we could influence in the negative way? We could influence in a, how many have influenced in a negative way? Recently. In some way. Through your attitude, through your words, through your, your okay, not your words, but your. <sighs> it's funny. I just bought a car and, uh, 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 uh. The horn doesn't work. It's a nice car, but the horn doesn't work. And at first I was like, man, what? The horn, first of all, it has to work for you to sell a car. Second of all, and then I thought about it, I was like, do you realize, like, the, the, I thought this to myself, do you realize that one of the number one things that your wife asks you to stop doing is honking at people on the road? Coincidence, maybe. Grace of God, probably. And so how many times do I go, and I'm like, oh, yeah, thank you, Lord. Serious. And, and, and I, I was just thinking this on the way to church this morning. I was driving, and, and there's a car in front of me parked at a red light. I'm approaching the red light, so I start to slow down. And guess what? The lane next to me is wide open. You know what that means? I can get over. I don't have to worry about this guy. I can just. And then I thought, why do I have to change lanes? What is in me that makes me have to be in a hurry? Why can't I just follow the traffic? Why can't I just go of the speed limit, follow this guy? Why do I have to go around him? And if he goes too slow, why does that irritate me? And then the back of my car says, worthy is the lamb. <laughs> so I was like, might have been a mistake. I just realized that. But he is worthy. Even in my, my speeding or my bad driving habit, he's worthy. No, I'm not justifying it. There are things that are in Aaron Breeze that needs to change. There are things that are unpleasing to the Lord, things that grieve the Holy Spirit. They are not what they used to be, praise God, but they are still here, and they're not going to be what they might be tomorrow because they're not going to be here. Oh, Aaron, you're just saying, no, I've made up my mind. I'm not leaving this place the same way I came in. Why? My wife deserves better, my son deserves better, and my neighbors deserve better, my coworkers deserve better. God deserves better because he created me to walk as Jesus walked and, and share in his sufferings. You can clap, it's okay. Thank you. I don't know. I, I, I see a lot of problems. We all see problems, but we're not so fast to offer solutions when the solutions are these scriptures. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Bless your enemies. Do you realize that the Bible also says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against power? Why, why do you have human enemies? Why are you praying for people and saying, Lord, I'm praying for my enemies? 
You know what Jesus did to the people who were whipping him and beating him beyond recognition? He said, Lord, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Do you realize that before Jesus could start his ministry, that that he was baptized and then all of a sudden the heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit ascended on him and then he went into the wilderness? And it was God's plan for his life. In fact, Mark, the way it explains it is the Spirit rushed him into the wilderness. It was an urgent move of the Holy Spirit to get him into that wilderness. Why? So that the Bible says that after all the temptations and all of the trials and the, the interactions with Satan, Uh, 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 he left there filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. There is something on the other side of your desert. There is something on the other side of your strife, your tiredness, your dehydration spiritually. There is something of value right on the other side. If we would submit to God, control our tongues, control our hearts, control the things we look at, the people we talk to, If we would get these things into check, we would enter into this thing. What is this thing? Let's go to Isaiah 35. Did I give you guys that, Kent? I don't think I did. If you could pull it up, I'd appreciate it. Sorry. Isaiah 35. And this, this is titled probably in your Bible something like the glory of Zion, something around those lines. Glory is a good thing. It says, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. And it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. We talk about the rose of Sharon. This is what this is talking about. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. Make uh, make firm the uh, feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Watch this. With vengeance, with recompense of God, he will come and save you. He's a good God. Let's keep going. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. This is what we've been talking about. This is everything we've been talking about wrapped up in Isaiah. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of jackals where each lay. There shall be grass with reeds and uh, rushes. It's like the restoration of Eden. A highway shall be there. This is so good. A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. This is why you go through the wilderness, through the desert places, because it shall be for others. But the highway for you is the highway called holiness. Whosoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, no shall any ravenous beast go upon it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy. Who needs everlasting joy? On their heads they shall uh, obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Almost sounds like 2020 shall flee away. Now it came to pass in the 14th year. uh, Let's stop right there. That's fine. It's still good. But Isaiah 35 is this beautiful jewel of goodness in this long streak of God's wrath and dryness and irritation. But on the other side of this desert, I'm I'm speaking this over your lives. On the other side of this desert comes this highway of holiness, comes this beautiful greenery, comes this beautiful shade and parched lands and and restore all of these things that you've been asking God for in the desert place, but God is saying it's on the other side. Are you with me? Am I the only one in the desert? Praise God, we can go together. If you'd stand, Leah, if you'd come.
deserts, there's all kinds of different deserts. It's just a fact. Uh, there's the Amazon, there's the Mojave, right? Um, there, there's all kinds of different deserts. I've, I've been to and I've dwelled in and I've lived in uh, Ethiopian deserts. It's no fun. It's a lot of, a lot of glory, but it's no, it's no fun to the flesh. There's all kinds of different deserts. And your desert and my desert might look different. We might be in need of different types of living water. I mean, it's all Jesus, but we might be, you might need a healing in your body, and I might need joy in my soul. You might need restoration in a family, and, and, and your marriage might be broken, and your child might be off wandering, and it's really causing you to have a broken heart, and every day you wake up in misery and pain. You might be the one causing misery and pain. You might be the wayward Christian who, who, who you were walking with the Lord and then things got irritating and hard and difficult and people offended you and, 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 and done you wrong. And instead of walking in forgiveness because you didn't know how, you, you held on to bitterness and resentment and now you got into the world and one thing led to another and somehow you found yourself here. Your desert and my desert might not look alike, but the answer is the same. His name is Jesus. And so this is what the altar call is going to be. Simple. If you are going through a desert experience and you know that you have something that you need to change on the inside of you, and this is why you're wandering, and you want God to come in and make that change for you because you can't do it in your own power, then I want you to come forward. And I want you to receive that work of God. It, it could be something small to one person but large to you. It, it, we're not pretending we know what, what, what your problem or your issue is. I'm preaching this word and I have something in me that I identify that I need to change. I, I'm down, I'm here at the altar. And we're going to be patient. Heavenly Father, I pray that you speak to the hearts of your people because you have a plan and a purpose and you have this wonderful oasis of fulfillment that is on the other side of their desert experience. But Lord, there are things that have to be purged out of us. There are attitudes and uh, that need to change. There are, are postures that we need to make. There are submissions that we need to take that need to take place in our lives. There is a tongue that needs to be controlled. There is a heart that needs to forgive. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you highlight these areas in our lives because today we want to deal with it. You are the answer today, right now. We don't have to start this road of recovery. We can just, we can just walk in it. We can receive it by faith and walk in it. So speak to us today, God. Speak to our hearts. What I'm going to do, and, and you guys feel free to keep coming forward if the Lord reveals something to you. Uh, I'm going to pray for you guys. But I want you, to, I want you to audibly, I want you to kneel before the Lord. I want you to have this conversation with God and open your heart to the work that he's doing. You walking up here is a sign of faith, but there is nothing magical about this carpet. There's not. An altar place represents a meeting with God, but that meeting still has to happen. And the Bible says, how can two walk together unless they first agree to meet? If it takes five minutes, 10 minutes, or an hour, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you fully open your heart and allow God to do the thing that he wants to do this morning.